thank you so much, uh, Jill. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the kind and generous introduction. And um, also, uh, Jill, I'm just kind of fooling around before I get started. Some people are uh, centering their emails to me in terms of getting admitted into the uh, presentation, FYI. Okay. So um, just to get started, thank you so much, uh, Jill, um, uh, for your outreach and your generosity in terms of um, allowing me to do this presentation through the Longwood Library. Um, I also wanna uh, extend a, a thank you to Allison Mirabella, uh, digital uh, coordinator extraordinaire who worked with me uh, to help me figure out how to get myself on camera uh, in advance of this meeting. Uh, thank you both. And again, thank you to the Longwood uh, Library. Um, and to the people that are on the call, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it means a lot to me for you to spend time and um, it's greatly appreciated. And I hope that the information that you're about to hear is a value add to you as well. Uh, COVID-19, Debunking the Myths is the title of my presentation. Um, in preparing my remarks tonight, I was thinking a lot about my dad. My dad was born in 1918, the same year as the really last major tragic uh, uh, pandemic, the Spanish flu started in 1918. Before it was finished, it killed more than four, uh, killed between 40 and 50 million people globally. Luckily, uh, my dad uh, survived. Um, lucky for me, lucky for my brother and sister, and lucky for all of our family members. Um, it's a great uh, metaphor for what goes around, comes around, and that history often repeats itself. Tonight's agenda is uh, the following. We'll take you through a small introduction, go through the popular myths associated with COVID-19, which will drive the discussions for us tonight. Um, there's a section on the history of pandemics that we'll review, and then we'll finalize with the COVID-19 uh, virus infection and what the treatments are, uh, including uh, the vaccine. Uh, Jill was uh, kind enough to review some of my uh, background, so no need to uh, add to it other than a couple of finer points she mentioned about my years at Pfizer. I did work in several areas, uh, including medical safety and risk management and regulatory affairs. A note about regulatory, which is where I um, I uh, got to liaise and work closely with um, the Food and Drug Administration. And I'm here to tell you that in the years that I was part of that group who dealt with in person, oftentimes down in Rockville, Maryland, with the FDA, it was a wonderful experience. And I can assure everyone on this call that the Food and Drug Administration is the finest health authority on the globe, bar none. They're extremely bright, hardworking, and, off, and always stay above the politics. Now, I know in these political times, that may not seem to be the case, but in the years that I served uh, in, in liaising with them, that was always the case. Um, uh, Jill mentioned also uh, my background uh, as an adjunct professor. I did want to uh, and also that I published uh, in uh, various um, areas, including nerve, neuropathic and musculoskeletal pain, neurosciences, uh, depression, uh, where I worked on Zoloft and then finalized with kidney cancer. Um, I did wanna mention that I'm very passionate uh, and, I, and I also currently lecture um, on pharmaceutical me medicine to medical schools in the local metropolitan area. Um, uh, through Pfizer's medical elective program. But I am very passionate about um, uh, teaching young people about uh, the dangers and the tragedy of smoking and vaping. I've been doing this since 1987, the year that unfortunately my mother passed away suddenly and quite young due to her cigarette addiction. And since that time, 
every year I go into the middle school mostly to talk about kids uh, about this uh, catastrophe and the catastrophic consequences. Uh, this year I wasn't able to, to attend, but I did put together a PowerPoint presentation, which I narrated and uh, they were able to listen to. I'm a scientist. I'm not a politician. Um, I've worked for years um, in publications and writing and reviewing various publications uh, throughout my career. Every slide that you're about to see tonight does not come from the internet, Instagram, Facebook, but comes from these publications. Uh, for those of you on the call who are, sci who are science background, and some of you are, these will be readily, um, uh, uh, no, you'll readily understand and you'll readily recognize them. For those of you who may not recognize them, these are all peer reviewed journals. That means that the information that I'm presenting tonight is verified, validated, and not based on opinion. They are based on fact. And so it's very important that I like my audience to be grounded in the science. And this is how I do it by relying on the medical literature to guide me through the information that I research. But I, am, I do have to throw in this disclaimer that despite the best efforts of many, we simply don't have all the answers to the questions that surround the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And it's just too new. COVID-19 is still a condition that, we're, that just started in 2020, uh, January and February. Uh, it might've been a little bit into 2019 when uh, the Chinese government knew about it, but for all intents and purposes, this is a relatively new disease that hasn't got all the answers and the publications reflect that. It is clearly from the time that the pandemic hit in early 2020 to now, we've learned so much. And that's why the uh, overwhelming of the healthcare system that occurred six, seven, eight months ago uh, should not be happening now, if for no other reason that we have much better treatments and God willing a vaccine, uh, which will come soon. So despite all, not having all the answers, we've made great progress. Well, what are the popular myths that exist uh, now? Uh, one, of the most, uh, one of the most important ones has to do with uh, the origin of the pandemic. Uh, was this a bioterrorism attack on the world from a secret laboratory in Wuhan, China? Or did this occur naturally in the wild, which often is how viruses start to leap into humankind? What's the answer? Well, I'll tell you right now, it did not start in a laboratory. And there's many ways that scientists have proven that uh, fact. What about the infectiousness and the lethality of this disease versus the flu? How infectious is it? Is it more or less lethal than the flu? We'll talk about that. Um, we'll spend uh, a little bit of time talking about transmission, mostly right now, that this is an airborne disease. It is something that can also be picked up on the surfaces, uh, on various surfaces. Uh, the virus can live on certain surfaces longer than others. Um, but airborne uh, transmission uh, is definitely uh, something that this virus does. And what about immunity? We're reading about people who um, are getting the virus and then getting reinfected a short time later. Is that a question of faulty uh, testing? They didn't really have the virus the first time? No, it is not. The scientific literature has confirmed that there are several of these cases. So if you get uh, infected, how long are you immune? No one knows. And if you get a vaccine, how long will that immunity last? We don't know that either. Um, what about the risk to young people and older people and those with pre-existing conditions? Well, I'll answer that question now. We know that young are less susceptible to severe infections, but not in all cases versus older people who like it or not, despite the best shape that you might think you're in, 
your immune system does become compromised as you become older. And if you have pre-existing conditions or comorbidities, you are more at risk. In terms of recovery, how long? If you do recover, how well? Um, that is something uh, for us to ponder. And what about the percent of cases versus death? Is there a big discrepancy between getting infected and dying? We'll, we'll touch on that. And then we'll finalize with treatments and vaccines. Some of you may be a little bit cynical about FDA approval and the approval process. Some of you, some of you are, are cynical about that, but I'm here to assure you that the system is quite bulletproof and I'll explain to you why. And then finally, if you've been keeping track as I have about the, uh, the disease and the uh, treatments, you heard an awful lot, especially at the beginning of the pandemic about hydroxychloroquine and how effective is it. And it really had to do with clinical trials. Not all clinical trials are equal. Um, some are better than others. And that was the fate of hydroxychloroquine. And we'll talk about that. But maybe the biggest mystery of all has to do with why do some people, why does COVID-19 affect people so differently? And for some people, COVID-19 is going to be relatively mild, almost barely noticeable, while others are going to become very ill and end up uh, in a hospital fighting for, the li for their lives. Why? Why is that? We want to talk about that tonight. So let's talk about some, uh, just something basic. What is a virus? Well, surprisingly, um, uh, viruses are the most, e most abundant form of life on the face of this earth. Uh, more abundant than ants, more abundant than cockroaches, more abundant than beetles. Um, but they teeter on, the, uh, on life and not life. Um, because for a virus to really do what it does, it has to enter the body. And once it enters the body, it has to enter the cell. So in the case of COVID, it comes in, the virus comes in through um, uh, the airways, through either the eyes, the mouth, or the nose. It then travels into the airways through the trachea and ultimately finds its way into the lungs. Um, once it gets into the lungs, it penetrates deeply into the lungs, and in particular, the place that's most important, the alveoli. That's where air exchange occurs, and the virus finds its way and figures out a way to enter into the cell. Once it enters into the cell, it hijacks the machinery of the cell and does only one thing. It lives to grow and reproduce, but it has to be in the cell in order for it to do its work. Some people, some biologists call a virus nothing more than a parasite with bad news wrapped in protein. And indeed, um, in the uh, early part of this year in Wuhan, China, uh, bad news showed up in a coworker at a wet market who contracted uh, the disease of COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 is not a new, uh, is a new disease, but the coronavirus has been around for a very long time. There's many, many forms of the coronavirus, but COVID-19 had not previously been seen in, in uh, humans. And that's why we have no immunity. But coronaviruses exist, um, and even the common cold is a type of coronavirus. Now, bats, in particular are infamous for carrying a reservoir of deadly viruses. And they carry the, uh, the novel coronavirus virus that causes COVID-19. Um, as I've mentioned, COVID-19 symptoms can range from mild to severe, and they spread uh, from human to human quite easily. And I'll show you why on another slide. Um, but may no, make no mistake about it, the virus that causes COVID-19, officially known as SARS-CoV-2, severe um, uh, acute res uh, respiratory syndrome, is a uh, disease that's respiratory first and foremost. But we now know that the virus itself um, uh, attacks every major organ system in the body, which makes it 
uh, in part why it's so deadly. So let's look at the profile of the novel coronavirus. And I wanna highlight on the left, a picture from an elect, elect, electron microscope. And I'm highlighting what's known as the spike protein. The spike protein is the way that the virus penetrates the cell. And contained within the cell is also genetic material. And this is how the virus reproduces but it is the spike, these club-like projections that allow it to bind to particular receptors within the body and then penetrate those cells and cause their destruction. Interestingly, as a pharmacologist, the structure of all diseases, whether it be cancers, uh, bacteria, um, high blood pressure, what the disease does is it reveals where a drug target could potentially intercede in the illness. And in this case, the structure of the virus and the spike protein in particular is a perfect drug target for treatment and therapeutics, but especially the vaccines. Um, this slide uh, is a, a, a history of the pandemics. And you can see on the left, it's kind of a timeline. And on the right is uh, also highlighting the amount of lethality or death associated with all of these um, pandemics. So you can see that pandemics go back uh, to, the, to the early 1300s where the bubonic plague killed more than 200 million people worldwide, lasted, started in the 1300s, and essentially wiped out 30 to 50% of Europe's population. It took, more than, um, it took more than 200 years for the population to uh, reestablish itself. Um, you can also see the Spanish flu represented here. Um, you can see smallpox here, which killed more than 56 million people in the 1500s. Spanish flu, of course, in 1918. Along came AIDS in, the, uh, in 1981 is really when it started. But wanna highlight for you down below with the two yellow arrows, COVID-19. So, and also these pictures are kind of an artist's depiction of uh, how much destruction they cause. So obviously the bigger pictures, more destruction, more death uh, versus a smaller one. So COVID-19 is still relatively small. Now, when this chart was uh, uh, published, it was back in May of uh, 2020. And you can see that it was 324,000 deaths globally. We now are north of um, over 1 million uh, deaths, uh, north of 250,000 deaths in the United States. Um, how small is the coronavirus? That's here. It's about 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 microns. Over here is a human hair follicle. Here is fine beach sand. Here's a grain of salt. Here's a white blood cell, a grain of pollen. Here's dust and a red blood cell and on down the line. Um, it even has um, a smoke particle over here. Um, coronavirus that causes COVID-19 is smaller than all of these. So it's really, really tiny. As I said, 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 microns. That's about 1 25 thousandths of an inch. Well, let's talk about similarities and differences versus the flu. And they are common to both, uh, COVID-19 versus the flu, they're common to both. Um, they're both contagious, they're both respiratory illnesses. They cause the classic symptoms that you hear about on TV. And if you've been unfortunate enough, and I have uh, early on before I got the flu vaccine, uh, you are very familiar with fever, cough, um, et cetera, the body aches in particular. Uh, can be devastating. Uh, they spread, both spread uh, via the air through physical contact and from person to person 
as well as by touching services, uh, surfaces. And older adults, because of their less than immune system and people with comorbidities are more susceptible, women who are pregnant are also more at risk. Um, in terms of influenza, it can cause mild to uh, severe illness. Um, takes about one to four days for the infection to develop symptoms. And then younger children are at higher risk of severe disease. Um, COVID-19 uh, spreads much more easily, and I'll show you why in a second. Uh, more super spreaders. It does take longer to develop the infection. It does cause more serious illnesses at times in some people, including the curious change in loss uh, um, or loss of smell and taste. Um, and also clotting factors. Um, it also may take longer to show symptoms and be contagious for a longer period of time. And although somewhat rare, uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit more about children less than five years of age and the multi-system inflammatory syndrome disease, similar to Kawasaki syndrome that has also been associated, but again, not necessarily a causal relationship, but definitely related and fortunately not that common, but can occur. Um, the fatality rate of a person who gets COVID-19 is approximately six times that of the uh, seasonal flu. Um, so let's talk about the contagiousness and lethality of the coronavirus. Um, I'm just gonna highlight for purposes of this presentation, um, SARS, COVID-2, which is uh, the co coronavirus, COVID-19, um, the SARS pandemic of 2003, and then influenza of 1918. You can see the others, which are actually somewhat cut off on my, um, on my slide. I don't know, Jill, if you can kind of get rid of some of the people that I'm seeing on the screen so I can see the rest of my slide, but not a problem. Um, the way that you can uh, determine how contagious a virus is, is through what's known as the, um, uh, uh, the R number, which is the effective reproductive, uh, reproduction number. This essentially tells you how infectious a disease is for its capacity to spread. So for example, if R is less than one, if the R naught is less than one, then each existing infection causes less than one uh, infection. That's good. But look at what's happening with COVID-19. We have an R rate of, of 2.5. That means that for every one person who, infect, uh, who gets the infection, they potentially will infect two and a half other people. Now, I scrutinized many publications and found a potential reproductive rate as high as 5.7. Um, that's astounding. And in terms of the proportion of deaths in people younger than 65 years of age, this is not, this disease is not impacting them as much as um, the influenza uh, pand uh, pandemic, um, the great Spanish flu of 1918, where 95% of people under this, uh, the age of 65 uh, succumbed uh, to the disease. Um, so let's use an R of 2.5. What does it mean? It means that out of 100 people, they will infect 250. 250 people, or again, just do the math, 100 times 2.5. 250 people would infect 625 other people. 625 goes to 1,563. 3908 goes to 97.70, that goes to 24.425 and winds up, and I can go further, 61,063 infected by one person with an R of 2.5. You can double that if the reproductive rate and the transmiss transmissibility of COVID-19 is in fact 5.7.
Can you imagine? So this explains the tragic numbers and the terrible catastrophe that we are facing, not only in the United States, but around the globe. It's based on the transmissibility of this, uh, of COVID-19. Now, how did we get here? On the left-hand side of the slide is a picture of, and, and it's uh, highlighted in red, of all the places around the world that have cases of COVID-19. And you can see that it covers a large part of the globe. Amazingly, Antarctica is unaffected. And by the way, this was taken as of November 8th, a couple of days ago. Granted, there aren't a whole lot of people that live in Antarctica, so that might be one reason, but you can see that the global cases are 50 million and the global deaths are now past 1 million. And again, based uh, in large part due to the um, uh, transmissibility factor of 2.5 at least. Um, but, and so we think that the coronavirus actually originated in bats and that the virus made it jump into a human, 41 year old male who happened to be at the Wuhan China open air wet market. But the thing is, is that the Wuhan market may not have been selling bats at the time. So the suspicion has now fallen on pangolins. If you've never uh, heard of what a pangolin is, let me show you a picture. It's essentially a delicacy uh, in China, and it, and it uh, looks a, a lot like a, a giant anteater. And of course, bats also may be the culprit in terms of where the virus has come from. Somewhere between these two is how we got to where we were, uh, to where we are. And how, do, how has this happened? So if you look at SARS of 2003, and you consider that a bat infected what is known as a civet, which is essentially a cat combined that looks a little bit like an otter and actually looks somewhat uh, combined with a walrus. Um, you could see that SARS started probably in a bat, went to the civet and then uh, uh, leaped into, man, into humankind. Um, MERS, the Middle East Re uh, Respiratory Syndrome back in 2012, which killed um, approximately 8,000 people, but none in the US, um, started in the Middle East, um, jumped from a bat to a camel, and then into human beings. We think, as I just mentioned, that either the pangolin uh, uh, started the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus um, that went directly into people or that the pangolin and, and a bat were kind of the middle vectors and that they then infected us. Um, should have shown this at the beginning. You can see that um, SARS-CoV infected 8,000 people, 774 uh, died. Uh, MERS um, led to uh, 2,494 infections, 858 died, only two US deaths. Really though, we are in a situation where because of global encroachment and as we pan out into the wilderness through the development process of humankind, human encroachment is encountering these animals that we've never encountered before. And this has led to these leaps from animals to humans. And it's not so much eating an animal that's uh, really the problem uh, if as long as it's cooked, but it's the handling of these animals that occur in these uh, various cultures around the world, such as killing, skinning, butchering, that is highly risky. And that is how these viruses jump. It's as long as you are eating a cooked animal of these types, amazingly, um, it's pretty safe, but it's the way that you get there that is causing the risk. And that is the leaping from these reservoirs that are hiding in bats, civets, camels, 
um, and other creatures, again, that we've never encountered before. And because we are encroaching on their territory, they're now in return gifting us with these viruses. Um, the human encroachment is a major issue as humankind has spread out into these wilderness, we're encountering illnesses that we have no immunity for. And the, and, and the infections can be intense. On the left is a um, electron microscopic uh, picture of re respiratory cilia that line our airways. And these cilia are constantly moving debris and other organisms, viruses, bacteria out of our lungs and up into our mouth to be swallowed or spit where it's harmless. But coronavirus, a picture here of a um, stained slide of a real uh, human cilia being infected by the red um, uh, coronavirus. So you can see how intense the infection can be. But we now know that the human coronavirus attacks every major organ system in our body, the brain in terms of causing uh, stroke, um, seizures, it infects the eyes, conjunctivitis, and red eye in particular, and people with very severe illness, um, inflammation of the eye. The nose, where the nose endings are being impacted and causing a loss of taste and smell. The lungs is ground zero for the pandemic. Uh, this is where it all starts. The heart and blood vessels are obviously impacted. We're seeing people with this disorder, with the infection, unfortunately, succumbing to uh, heart attacks, uh, young people, including uh, athletes, are suffering from uh, my myocarditis or inflammation of the heart. They're also suffering from clotting. Uh, COVID-19 seems to increase clotting factors within the body. And that's led to problems um, somewhat in the liver where liver enzymes are being elevated in hospitalized patients, clearly indicative of liver damage and the kidneys. No one knows if the kidney damage that, has being, that is being uh, uh, occurring is due to uh, either something upstream in terms of blood clots or a direct effect. And then finally, the intestines are being impacted with diarrhea. No, bot no, no, no doubt, bottom line, COVID-19 attacks almost anything within the body and can have devastating consequences. Now, roughly 5% of patients who become infected are going to get critically ill, but some patients experience long-term symptom complications and they're listed here. We have some of the long haulers who just can't get rid of the illness. Um, don't have to be a long hauler to experience fatigue, headaches, and dizziness. Um, people infected are experiencing cognition problems, not thinking well, even hair loss, I mentioned the cardiac issues, and certainly cardiopulmonary issues are rampant with decreased lung capacity. And even though people with COVID-19 infections are often mild or asymptomatic, about 80%, here's my biggest problem. What do we know about what's going to happen to them down the road? It is still unknown what other yet to be determined complications are going to develop. And that worries me a lot because you can say that, oh, I had it, I got tested, I got it. I even have some antibodies. It was mild, I hardly even noticed it. But I say to you, you don't know because we don't have the data yet, what's going to happen down the road. And that is a concern. Uh, you don't know what the impact could be on morbidity and God forbid on life expectancy. Another question, why does COVID make some people much sicker than others? Well, it definitely could be due to autoantibodies where people develop antibodies against themselves, but most likely uh, genetic mutations are the culprit uh, where you're less able to fight the virus. And here's something of particular concern. There's something that's being experienced uh, in people with severe illness that go beyond the virus and that's called a cytokine storm. Cytokines are uh, essentially substances that help the immune system get rid of the virus. But 
if it becomes uh, hyperactive and goes into overdrive, that protective mechanism actually turns into a pathologic condition. Um, so instead of helping cytokines to get rid of the virus, they actually reverse and cause tremendous damage. Why? No doubt, genetic mutation. How do you know if you're like this? You don't, but there is some hope and I wanna show you that later on. So what is the impact? Well, we know about quarantining, the, uh, the tragedy of people not being able to get together with families and every one of us ex is experiencing this. The travel industry is in a complete shambles and there are supply shortages throughout the country and the world. All of these uh, older adults, people with heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, all of these people have in, case, in many cases compromised immune system. Diabetics have a compromised immune system and there's a thought that um, high blood sugar actually helps the virus grow and develop and reproduce. Clearly people with cancer are compromised from an immunological perspective. I've already talked about the problems with chronic kidney disease and obesity is a major problem. People who are obese um, really have a compromised immune system and their lung capacity is less than normal, uh, normal people um, who are not obese. Uh, some more bad news, COVID-19 does inflict its damage at times on young individuals. It doesn't happen often, but COVID-19 related stroke has been known occur to occur, but luckily um, not at a great rate. And the last piece of bad news is that men rather than women are more at risk for suffering from greater severity of COVID-19. Why? lifestyle, men drink more, uh, eat, eat bad things. And um, also men just by uh, genetics and by natural selection, maybe due, to meta, uh, maybe due to endocrine differences versus women also have uh, less viable immune systems uh, probably due to endocrine issues. Um, I wanna talk a bit about um, US deaths uh, by age and race. You can see that um, up until 45, and this is a small amount of data in the US, February to June, 2020, up, until, up to 45 to 54 years of age, there's really nothing going on in terms of mortality for very young people. At 45 to 54, it jumps up to 5%. And then when you consider from 55 to 85 years and older, 92, that uh, correlates to 92% of that, those age categories are um, suffering 92% uh, of, uh, of COVID-19 deaths attributed to that age group. Over here with Africa, uh, with um, US deaths by race and ethnicity, you can see the numbers for black uh, and African American, black African Americans. And what's troubling about that is that African Americans make up approximately 13% of the total population, but suffer 23% of associated deaths. That's way out of line. So clearly there's socioeconomic factors that have been well documented in the literature and in the media, and probably due to poor socio, clearly due to poor socioeconomic disadvantages, close living, uh, uh, quarters and potentially education. Quick note about that uh, syndrome called Kawasaki-like uh, disease and associated with um, COVID-19. This is really just a, um, uh, a shock-like condition that does occur in children less than five, five years and younger, um, uh, characterized by vasculitis, high fever, and essentially uh, shock. Uh, throughout the body can be very, very uh, dangerous. Uh, fortunately, it's in a low amount of cases, causality is somewhat established, but not really. And then uh, a small picture of what vasculitis, for those of you on the call, 
who do this for a living, you're very well, very much familiar nurses, healthcare practitioners with the vasculitis that I'm showing you on this picture. Um, a quick note on the different phases of clinical research for a point. There are many of uh, the different phases of, of clinical research, phase one, first in human safety, proof of concept in phase two, and then phase three efficacy. When it comes to um, uh, vaccines and other studies, randomized controlled clinical trials are the gold standard. This is when subjects are randomly assigned to both the treatment and control. This is what the FDA mandates in terms of getting a vaccine or a, a synthetic therapeutic approved. But there are other study designs that including what's known as a meta-analysis. There are many other study designs besides a meta-analysis, but they're less rigorous. And so is a meta-analysis less rigorous. Why? Because it pools data. And when you pool data from different studies, you can run into all kinds of confounding factors. But I highlight this because in a well-done, scrutinized, peer-reviewed journal article based on a meta-analysis done where data was pooled on the effect of hydroxychloroquine, it was shown based on a meta-analysis, a different type and less rigorous type of study that it was helpful as long as you administered it early in the condition and it was outside of a hospital. So let's finalize with some of the potential treatments. Um, here they are listed, antiviral drugs, which um, work in a number of ways, including pre preventing replication. Dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory, such an old drug, goes all the way back to approval in 1957. We have immune-based therapies, convalescent plasma, which is essentially taking blood from uh, patients who have recovered from the disease, from COVID-19 and injecting those antibodies into patients who have the disease. Monoclonal antibodies, which are synthetically derived, laboratory de derived um, antibodies. And then of course I put hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Now, President Trump, uh, went to the hospital for COVID-19. And he was administered eight different drugs. He was administered dexamethasone, which is a corticosteroid anti-inflammatory, prevents the cytokine storm that can be deadly. He was given remdesivir, an antiviral that is now approved, prevents the virus from replicating. He was given Regeneron's monoclonal antibody, which was a cocktail of two monoclonal antibodies. And he was also given zinc that supports immune health, but there's no evidence that it helps treat COVID. He was given vitamin D for bone health, um, no evidence that it reduces uh, the risk of COVID-19. Famotidine for uh, a pepsid for ulcers, obviously no impact on COVID. Melatonin to treat insomnia, and then aspirin to reduce the risk of blood clotting, which is prevalent in COVID-19. Um, remdesivir has been approved by the FDA. It's the first one that got approved. It does not reduce mortality in COVID-19 patients. What it does do is it found to shorten recovery time in hospital, hospitalized patients. A very important discovery, but does not reduce mortality. That is dexamethasone, that old drug from 1957, when it was first approved, generically available in every hospital, should be in every hospital across this nation, is the first drug that was shown to reduce mortality in hospitalized patients. There are some caveats. The key of dexamethasone is reducing that cytokine storm, which can really kill you um, if you have the genetic predisposition that it's going to occur. And if it does occur, as I said, it's devastating. Dexamethasone can reverse it and save your life. The COVID-19 pandemic represents the greatest health crisis um, across the globe since the great pandemic of, uh, of um, influenza uh, in 1918. In terms of vaccines, this is the status we have many in phase one testing safety, phase two 
expanded safety studies phase three, which is where the large scale efficacy studies are done. Um, a couple uh, for early use, none are approved as of yet. What do uh, vaccines do? They stimulate the immune system to produce antibodies. So they imitate a condition, a disease, just like if you're exposed to the actual disease. After you get vaccinated, you develop those antibodies and you're immune to the disease without having to get um, uh, the disease first. But remember, vaccines prevent the infection. They are not a cure for the disease. Exciting news. And it's not just because I'm a former employee of Pfizer. Um, their vaccine has shown a greater than 90% effective, effectiveness rate. A few caveats. It hasn't been published yet. No one's read the data. They did issue a press release. Um, everyone has reviewed the protocol that is available. You can read it yourselves. Um, storage conditions, uh, very, very cold storage conditions, minus uh, 70 degrees uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit, I forget. Um, uh, so important and difficult storage conditions. Don't know how long immunity lasts, but 90% effectiveness is astounding and extraordinary and something to be extremely optimistic about. Um, uh, how much immunity, as I indicated, we're not sure yet. Why is this exciting? New technology, never been done before. Messenger RNA vac uh, vaccine. Greater effectiveness with this technology. Huge safety advantages. And importantly, shorter manufacturing times. Pfizer is already producing tens of millions of vials uh, for di eventual distribution uh, to the United States and the globe. Real quick, how does a vaccine like this work? You take a healthy, normal volunteer, you give them the vaccine, which sends a message to the body to manufacture antibodies specifically against that virus spike. When you get infected with the coronavirus, the coronavirus comes in, but the spike isn't there because the vaccine eradicated, uh, eradicated the spike, nowhere for it to go, still healthy. This is a picture of the, of the uh, um, virus itself. Those are the spikes, all the spikes are gone. Neutralization of the virus via a vaccine. More, new, more good news, Lilly just unveiled a uh, monoclonal antibody that they are now in emergency use authorization status for. That means that under emergency use, you could get it. This is not the one that President Trump got. He got the Regeneron one. This comes from Eli Lilly, but it's along the same lines of a monoclonal antibody synthetically derived in the laboratory. Last, uh, getting toward the end. Some of you are cynical about the FDA, and I understand why. There's a fail-safe mechanism that will assure that the American people get a vaccine that is safe and effective. How? Because an independent advisory committee will sit in front of the FDA and make a recommendation. You can see the different types of advisory committees. These are independent, they're academicians, they don't work for the FDA, they make a recommendation. Uh, and there is a blood vaccine and other biologic um, uh, uh, advisory committee. These provide independent advice um, to the FDA on various scientific and technical matters. Although the committees make recommendation to the FDA, the, de uh, the, the decision is still the FDA, but here's something for you to keep in mind. More than 90% of the recommendations that are made by an advisory committee to FDA are accepted by the FDA. Greater than 90%, I haven't looked at that data lately, but I would imagine that it's closer to 98 and 99%. And then who are the people that sit on these committees? They're academicians, they're physician scientists, they're physician researchers, they're statisticians. Most of them come from academia, as I said and there's often a consumer representative, patient representative on it as well. How about the future? Well, one day soon, if you are afflicted with the virus and you are extremely sick, 
we will be de developing potential biomarkers which are going to tell healthcare pr uh, practitioners how you are probably going to do. It's going to be based on inflammatory biomarkers such as uh, those cytokines, what's the level, and biochemical uh, biomarkers, uh, liver enzymes. So those will be in front and those will tell a physician uh, the potential severity of your condition. So the future looks very, very bright. And that concludes my presentation. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. And um, back to you, Jill, uh, for any questions that might have come in. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. That was a lot of information to digest. Let's see if anyone has any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat and we'll see if um, you know Dr. Claire can answer them for you. I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Sure, um, you know how people do temperature checks before you enter a building or a doctor's office? Um, I do understand some patients never develop a fever with COVID, but um, I understand oftentimes your O2 sat drops. Would that be a better marker to measure somebody's O2 sat as opposed to temperature? What is the, what is that called? O2? The, oh, the o oxygen saturation. You know, they have the little fingers. Is, would, would that be a Sure. Yeah, well, fever is pretty typical in even asymptomatic patients. I know that's a somewhat of a contradiction, but many patients who are asymptomatic still develop fever. They don't get the respiratory illnesses. They don't get the aches and pains. Um, yes, an oxygen uh, meter on the, the tip of your finger would be even better. Something tells me though, that if your oxygen level was dropping or had dropped to let's say below 80%, that you probably weren't showing up at that event anyway, because at that point, you're probably having a little bit of difficulty breathing. Any mitigation strategies that we can develop to keep crowding from happening or keeping people away from other people are going to be very valuable in the future. You're right, taking a, a temperature going into a building is not uh, perfect, but it is certainly a start. Okay, you have a question from a patron. Um, when they do the vaccine trials, do they give them COVID-19 on purpose to test it? Yeah, it's a great question. Something that I wasn't clear about a couple of weeks ago either. Fortunately, I was able to read the Pfizer protocol, which again is available online. Here's what they do. They um, have a treatment group and then they have a placebo group and they expose both groups to um, settings where they are most likely able to catch the virus. They are not inoculated with the virus. They are put out in the environment where they are, and I don't have all the details on this. Again, a very good question. I can get more information, but they're put out in an environment there where they are most susceptible and most, uh, and probably going to catch it by being in situations such as crowded conditions inside a restaurant et cetera. They are not inoculated with the virus, however. Okay. Um, is the vaccine live? It is not. And that's another great question. So there are many different types of vaccines. Uh, the polio vaccine and the flu vaccine are what are known as attenuated viruses. I like to think of attenuated viruses as viruses that are in suspended animation. They are not living and they are not dead. They are in between, but they are the full virus. Um, messenger RNA viruses are a snippet of the genetic material that is then given to a patient so that they can recognize that as a foreign invader and then build up immunity. And as I mentioned, the spike protein uh, is the messenger RNA. So it tells the body, hey, I want the body to, um, I'm messaging the body to create the spike. So that when you see the spike later on, and you, so now you have the spike, it's an invader, now you're gonna develop antibody. So it's not the full virus, it's not alive, um, it's, it's a portion of it. And for that reason, it's easier to manufacture, it's much, much safer, and the production value just goes up in terms of being able to manufacture it with a much, much more efficient manufacturing process. Are there, are there any, I'm sorry, are there any? Yeah, just real quick, much different than, um, uh, than the flu vaccine or the polio vaccine, for example. Are there contraindications to the virus? There, there will be. I mean, there, to the vaccine. There, yeah, 
there will be contraindications to, to the vaccine. I'm not familiar with what those will be at this point, just like when you take the flu vaccine, there are certain contraindications. And I'm sure that the once the uh, messenger RNA vaccines, which again are brand new technology, hit the marketplace, you will see the contraindications and be advised well in advance before you uh, venture over to get your shot. And by the way, there'll probably be two shots associated with um, these uh, messenger RNA vaccines. Okay, and uh, we have a patron uh, wrote, I am 79 with diabetes and high blood pressure. Does this mean I am more likely to get COVID or does it mean if I get it, I will be worse off than a younger person? Well, I'm not a physician, so you always wanna check in with your, uh, with your doctor to really get that question answered. We do know from the data, and I presented some of it tonight, that the elderly, people with pre-existing conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, um, uh, uh, other uh, heart disease are more, uh, uh, more, uh, more susceptible to more serious illness. It does not mean that it's a one-to-one -one relationship and that you will, but you need to be more vigilant and uh, everyone needs to be vigilant. You need to be vigilant as well. Okay, um, another question. Is there any truth to the blood type myth where people would say, oh, I'm a type A is more susceptible or is there any truth to that? Great question. I saw some data a couple of weeks ago, maybe about a month or two ago, that certain blood types were more uh, likely to be susceptible to the uh, COVID-19 virus. I have to admit that I have not seen follow-up data on that. But these um, types of information will be more forthcoming in the future. For right now, I would have to say that I'm not completely certain about that information. Okay, um, another question. Thank you for summarizing the latest treatment options. From your perspective, if you needed to receive treatment for COVID-19, which therapeutics would you want to receive based on the current knowledge? Well, again, you would always want to check in with your family doctor or your specialist to answer that question. All the medications that I put up uh, throughout this presentation are medications that I think any one of us, uh, God forbid, should we um, get the illness and have a serious form of it, would all want to consider. Um, it'll be up to your physician, your personal physician, again, either your primary or your um, uh, specialist, and uh, certainly people in the hospital if you head in that direction, who will help uh, answer that question. Every one of the uh, slides that I provided to you tonight were based on uh, safety and efficacy information that makes those medications valid and in line for use should you uh, contract a serious form of the illness. Great. Um, Dr. Claire, do you think generations after us will be born immune to COVID-19? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I hope. Um, this generation, uh, my generation, you can see that this is the older generation. Well, we haven't figured out how to become immune to the flu. And part of the reason is because these viruses mutate. And so even though you might develop immunity to one form and the flu is a perfect example, they mutate every year. Um, so immunity is not lifelong. That's why you have to get a flu shot for the new mutant or the new mutated flu. They differ from year to year. Now, with regard to the COVID-19 uh, and, and novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19, we are not seeing a lot of mutation. I know that there have been some anecdotal reports of super spreader of uh, COVID uh, coronavirus or more mutated and more lethal. I have not seen that in the literature reviews and the research and people that I have spoken to. So um, that's good. Now, whether or not we'll have to take a COVID vaccine every year remains to be seen. That's still an unknown. My gut feeling is that you probably will because of two factors. We're not sure about how long immunity lasts. And certainly we're not sure if your um, immunity um, you know, not only last, but uh, will it mutate? Will the COVID-19 uh, virus, uh, novel coronavirus mutate? So for that reason, we're probably looking at a progression. I don't know that any of these viruses per se, so many of them have not been lifelong immunity, unfortunately. 
Okay, uh, one more question. Um, if more than one vaccine, how do we know which is best for individuals? Hmm. I think they're asking, I guess, if more than one are approved. Yeah. Um, I think what will happen is that these vaccines will start to, I think, differentiate. And so there may be an advantage, let's say, to a certain demographic, let's say, to a certain age group, let's say, to a certain a comorbidity demographic to a certain cohort of younger patients, I think that they may start to separate. And so your physician eventually, if, they're, if we're fortunate enough to have vaccines to choose from, which is, will be a great thing, um, I think that will play out as we learn more about the vaccines and, and they start to, I believe, differentiate themselves in terms of being better for this age group, better for this age group, better for this comorbid condition, better for this pre-existing condition. You'll rely on your uh, family practitioner and or your um, specialist, again, the physicians that you work closely with and that monitor your health care uh, to best answer that question. Okay, thank you so much. Does anyone have any other questions? I don't see any. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. This was so informative and um, a lot to digest. And this will be, uh, it was recorded. So we're going to have it up on our Facebook page and you might want to watch it again so we can, you know, really digest the information. Thank you very much, Dr. Claire. This is wonderful. And thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Jill, for having me. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. you. Very much. Bye-bye.